Okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, thank you all for joining us for today's event, Manitoba's Hidden Creatures, to learn more about some species we often overlook. My name is Stephen Anderson, and I'm the Acting Information Coordinator at the Nature Conservancy of Canada here in Manitoba, and I'm happy to be your moderator today. Uh, I'd like to start by stating that we at the Nature Conservancy of Canada respectfully acknowledge that the work we do across the country is on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. The Nature Conservancy of Canada is a national charity and Canada's leading not-for-profit private land conservation organization, working to protect our most important natural areas and the species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and its partners have helped to protect 14 million hectares or 35 million acres coast to coast to coast. Um, to learn more, visit our website at www.natureconservancy.ca. Um, we're joined today by uh, Candace Park, a master's student from Brandon University, Reed Miller, a master of science student from the University of Manitoba, and Marika Olenek, an environmental educator and ecologist based out of Winnipeg. Um, before I begin the webinar, I would like to quickly cover a few housekeeping topics. Um, as we are being joined by people from across the province and country, you may experience a temporary glitch during the event. Um, we thank you in advance for your patience. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be sharing a link to the recording after the event, so keep an eye on your inboxes. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself or share it with colleagues, friends, and family. We also invite your comments and questions. Um, you will notice a chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it in there. Um, and please indicate who the question is intended for, and we'll answer all the questions at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Candace Park from Brandon University. As an undergraduate studying biodiversity at the University of Guelph, Candace developed an interest in animals that are often unloved or underappreciated, specifically reptiles. Since then, she has had the opportunity to participate in research on a variety of reptile species across Ontario. Currently completing a master's degree in biology at Brandon University, Candace's research focuses on the conservation of reptiles and amphibians in the mixed grass prairies of southwestern Manitoba and how they may be impacted by grassland management practices. The floor is all yours, Candace. Great, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for the intro, Stephen. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Candace, and I'm currently a graduate student in Brandon University's Master of Environmental and Life Sciences program, where I study grasses and reptiles. Today, I'll start off by briefly talking about reptile diversity in Manitoba, followed by some threats that they face, and a bit about my thesis research focused on their conservation. Manitoba is home to nine reptile species, two turtles, six snakes, and one lizard. Um, which are found in various habitats across the southern third of the province. First, the two turtle species found in Manitoba are common snapping turtles and western painted turtles, both of which inhabit various bodies of water, including ponds, lakes, and rivers. Next, we have two subspecies of the common garter snake. Red-sided garters are found all throughout southern Manitoba, while eastern garters are um, only found in the far southeast corner. Both subspecies tend to be habitat generalists, though are most often found in open forests or around wetlands. Plains garter snakes look very similar to the other two species, but are most often found in grassland habitats with nearby wetlands. Northern red-bellied snakes are Manitoba's smallest snake species, usually growing no lo longer than a ruler, and they too are habitat generalists. Smooth green snakes only grow a little bit larger than red bellies, and in Manitoba, they're most often found in grasslands, where their beautiful green coloration provides them with excellent camouflage. And our last species of snake is the plain hog plains hognose snake. This species lives in grassland habitats, where they require loose sandy soil to burrow in. To help them do this, they have an upturned nose that acts as a little shovel as they dig. Hognoses are known for a really interesting behavior to deter predators, which is playing dead. 
Uh, after attempts to intimidate a predator fail, as a last resort, they'll roll onto their back, stick out their tongue, and pretend that they're dying, which you can see in this video here of an eastern hognose snake. Finally, we have the northern prairie skink, Manitoba's only lizard species. Within Canada, this species is only found in Manitoba, where, the lizard, where lizards depend on mixed grass prairie habitats for specific temperatures and sandy soils that they require. Juvenile skinks are born with bright blue tails, as you can see on the left, uh, which fade to brown as they age. Also pictured here is an adult male, which during breeding season develop lovely orange chins. One of the incredible adaptations that these lizards have is the ability to detach their tails from their body, which serves as an anti-predator tactic. When grabbed by a predator, the tail will detach and actually thrash around on its own. This distracts the predator while the skink flees to safety and the tail will gradually grow back over time. So pictured here, you can see um, this is a skink that just recently lost their tail. And then this one here, though she's also missing a leg, uh, her tail is just starting to grow back. One of the major threats to the persistence of reptiles in Manitoba is habitat loss. And this is especially true for grassland species. For example, both Northern Prairie skinks and Plains hognose snakes are listed as special concern by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, mainly due to the loss and fragmentation of the specific habitats that they require. Temperate grasslands have been declared the most altered and endangered ecosystem on the planet. And this is due to extremely high rates of habitat conversion into land for human uses, largely for cropland and other agricultural practices. One example of this habitat loss can be found in mixed grass prairies. Occurring between tall and short grass prairie, mixed grass prairies are incredibly diverse grasslands and the critical habitat of the northern prairie skink. Unfortunately, most of this habitat in North America has already been converted for human use with less than 20% of the historic range in Canada remaining intact today. Historically, North American grasslands experienced common natural disturbance events, such as wildfires and the grazing of animals like plains bison. Prairie ecosystems are adapted to disturbance and it's therefore important to keep everything in balance. Since the colonization of the prairies, however, most of these natural sources of disturbance have been removed. And as a result, even grassland habitats that are protected from land conversion face the risk of habitat loss due to changes in the ecosystem, such as the encroachment of trees and other woody plants and the spread of invasive species. Efforts to reclaim and preserve grasslands typically focus on mimicking natural dis disturbance regimes, with one strategy being prescribed livestock grazing. This has had demonstrated success However, research is still limited on how grazing may impact animal populations, especially for reptiles. This is an important knowledge gap to address as grassland reptiles may be impacted by livestock grazing due to some species having low mobility or fragmented habitat and reliance on specific um, plant cover for things like predator avoidance, foraging, and thermal regulation, especially on the prairies where summer temperatures can get lethally hot. And this is where my project fits in. The main focus of my research is investigating the effects of grazing management on reptiles and mixed grass prairie habitat. My questions are first, does livestock grazing affect reptile populations and mixed grass prairie habitat itself? And second, how do environmental conditions change from the forest edge to the open prairie? Together, these questions will provide information about the key microhabitat conditions preferred by reptiles and how they may change with grazing disturbance. To answer these questions, last summer I surveyed mixed grass prairies in southwestern Manitoba, about 20 kilometers southeast of the city of Brandon. My main field site was the Na Nature Conservancy Canada's Yellow Quill Prairie Preserve. This property protects around um, 463 hectares of mixed grass prairie grassland, which is maintained by annual rotational cattle grazing. On its southern border, the prairie extends onto the Assiniboine Corridor Wildlife Management Area, owned by Manitoba Sustainable Development. This property supports comparable vegetation and reptile communities. However, it's not grazed. So throughout the summer, I carried out surveys at both locations in order to be able um, to compare the effects of grazing. My surveys consisted mainly of flipping cover boards to locate animals. And this image here is an example with a smooth green snake that I found curled up under one of the boards. At each of my 19 sites, plywood cover boards were deployed in a, along an array that spans from the forest edge to open prairie. And this diagram here shows the location of boards, um, cl clustered of boards, sorry, based on their distance from the forest edge, with one cluster 25 meters into the forest, 
one at the edge itself, and then the rest spanning uh, 100 meters into the prairie. For every individual animal I captured, I recorded morphometrics like size and mass and habitat temperatures, including both the capture temperature as well as hourly temperatures under coverboard, um, under coverboards, so that I could capture um, temperatures along the array. And we did that by placing uh, little thermal loggers under the boards. I also took photos of vegetation within a one meter square quadrat around the capture site to be able to estimate the percent of vegetation cover by various plant categories. Currently, I'm working away on analyzing the data. So while I don't have um, solidified results to share yet, what I can share are the number of animals that I found. So by the end of the field season, the number of animals caught at my coverboard arrays included 14 prairie skinks, two red bellies, 134 smooth green snakes, and two nests, um, as well as some amphibians, including three tiger salamanders and one Canadian toad. These numbers exclude observations that were outside of the coverboard arrays, where I also found hognose and plains garter snakes, um, snapping turtle nests, as well as leopard frogs and copse gray tree frogs. Ultimately, the goal of this work is to better inform grassland management decisions. Both mixed grass prairie habitat and grassland reptiles are of high priority for conservation research due to the threat of habitat loss. Knowing what habitat features are important to reptiles will allow for targeted management strategies working toward conserving both grassland reptile populations and prairie habitats. So this concludes my presentation. Um, thank you all so much for listening and special thanks to all of those listed on this slide for their support in the project. Thank you, Candice. Um, we appreciate you sharing your knowledge and research on Manitoba's reptiles and amphibians with us. Oh, my pleasure. Um, our next speaker today is Reed Miller from the University of Manitoba. Reed Miller is currently a Master's of Science student in the Department of Entomology at the University of Manitoba. He completed his research on the bees and beetles of the Manitoba Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, where he caught several new provincial records of both insect groups. Reed previously received a gold medal for his achievement in a major during his undergraduate degree in honors biology. Whenever you're ready, Reed. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, can everyone see it all right? Yes, no? Yep, you're good, Reed. Okay, okay. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, I completed my research on both bees and beetles, but today uh, in order time constraints, I'll just be sharing my beetle um, diversity uh, knowledge. Um, so this work was made possible by my supervisor, uh, Jason Gibbs, as well as Adam Bronke at the, at the Canadian National Collection um, in Ottawa, who helped with many of my identif identifications. So there's my little cheesy graphic for you. Um, so my uh, research uh, took place in the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in southeastern Manitoba which is the largest remnant tall grass prairie in Canada, home to rare and iconic plants and animals, such as the Western prairie fringed orchid that you see on the left. Um, like the mixed grass prairie, it's uh, formed and maintained by natural and human disturbance, which prevents woody encroachment and increases prairie plant diversity. Uh, tall grass prairie is the most fertile of the Great Plains grasslands, uh, with Manitoba representing the northernmost extent. Unfortunately, in uh, Manitoba, over 99% of tallgrass prairie is gone, and more recent uh, research suggests that this trend is also continuing. So my experiment involved trapping wild bees and beetles in sites subjected to different disturbance histories, so sites that were either semi-recently burned, semi-recently grazed, or didn't, uh, uh, weren't disturbed in the recent past. Uh, bees were sampled with bee bull traps and blue vein traps. Uh, beetles were sampled with baited pitfall traps, um, including using cow dung, uh, amyl acetate, ginger, and uh, fish skin. 
So in total, over the two years of my project, I caught over 19,000 uh, target beetles. Uh, so the target beetles that I was after are um, rove beetles and scarab beetles and their relatives. Um, together, they represent uh, over 100,000 plus species with rove beetles in particular representing the largest extant uh, family of any living organism. Um, uh, so to orient you on what these beetles do and how, what they're like, uh, most rove beetles are agile predators. Um, a lot of them run along the surface of the ground. Um, a lot of them are associated with decomposing organic matter where they uh, preferentially feed on pest fly eggs and uh, adults. Uh, scarabs are perhaps more familiar. Um, they're important in waste removal and nutrient cycling. Uh, what we have here on the right is actually a sylphid, but um, it's closely related to rove beetles. Um, sylphids are interesting because they, uh, um, they as a group, uh, these ne necrophorus is the genus, uh, they as a pair go to dead carcasses and then proceed to defer or defeather it and bury it and lay their eggs in it. Um, and then they actually, What's kind of rare among insects is they actually uh, do some parental care. Um, they actually feed their larvae, which is quite rare in beetles. Um, an interesting point uh, for Candace maybe, um, one species of uh, sylphid, which unfortunately I did not catch, is thought to um, be a, basically a parasitoid on um, snake or turtle eggs. So it's one of the only examples of a um, of an insect being a parasitoid of a vertebrate. So to talk about the new beetle records that I caught, um, in total I caught over 124 species over two years, and 19 of those represent new provincial or national records. Many of these records are tiny. Uh, some are associated with ants or mammal nests and feed on tiny mites. Uh, two of the examples we see here um, on the left, it's a Micropeplus sculptus. It's a very odd looking rove beetle, very sculptured and detailed. Uh, it's a decomposer uh, versus the one on the right. Uh, that is also a rove beetle. So gives you an idea of some of the diversity of body shapes within that family. Um, these guys are actually specialized in feeding on orbited mites. They have very specialized mouth parts that they use to drill into the tough shell of those mites. Um, I caught many other rove beetle records, most of them predators. Um, Stictolinus flavipes, which you see on the right, is this kind of bizarre looking one with a short neck and a wide head. Um, that's part of a group that's kind of rarely taken. Um, I also caught four species of Philanthus, which are kind of generalist predators. Uh, two of the records have these beautiful elytra that you see here. Um, I also caught um, two species of Tachyporus. Um, and thanks to Adam, we uncovered a previously undescribed species of Ishnosoma from my records. Um, it's known from other habitats, but it was previously misdiagnosed as its sister species. Um, I also caught two new records of Stenus, uh, including one uh, that's uh, unknown from anywhere else currently. Um, what's interesting is that I also caught species of potential conservation interest. Uh, the main one being this beautiful beetle that you see on the left, uh, Staphylinus ornaticata. Um, I caught about 14 of these, and my records represent about 25% of all the observations known for this beetle. Uh, it's currently unranked in Manitoba due to data insufficiency, but it's ranked critically imperiled in Ontario, uh, and it may be time to kind of put in a COSAWIC application to see the status of uh, this beetle. Uh, it's the only um, member of Staphylinus in North America. That's mostly a European uh, gen a genus. Uh, it's associated with groundwater and springs and bogs, which tended to be um, what a lot of my records were. Um, 
as some of you may know, the northern block of the Manitoba Tallgrass Prairie Preserve is very wet. Uh, so I caught a lot of wetland associated species. And just a little bit more about that new species of Stenus. So Stenus are also rope beetles. Um, they're very small um, with bulging eyes. Uh, they're considered habitat specialists. Um, this new species is heavily associated with three of my 18 study sites. Uh, it's currently awaiting description. What's neat about these guys is they feed on springtails and they're called water skaters because they produce a substance on their abdomen um, that reduces water tension. So uh, they leave a trail of reduced tension behind them that makes them scoot across the water really fast. So they walk on water basically. So the implications of all these new records, et cetera, uh, given the small geographic area of my study and with so many new records, clearly many new records and even new species await discovery in Manitoba. Um, what's less obvious from my presentation, but from my findings is that refugia, so free from grazing and fire, should be maintained in managed lands to avoid let local extirpation of species dependent on uh, organic matter accumulation and that may be sensitive to cattle trampling. Um, I, my project kind of exists in the brown world, which is kind of uh, less pretty than the green world of say bees and butterflies. Um, it's, hard, it's a hard sell to um, landowners to realize the benefit of decomposer and predator beetles. Um, but the process of waste removal and pest predation is key to healthy, beautiful ecosystems. Because without these beetles, we'd be swarmed with flies and knee deep in cow poop and dead mice. <laughs> so that's all I got. Uh, thanks for listening. Awesome, thank you, Reed. Um, we're grateful for you for your time today, um, especially sharing your expertise and showcasing those new beetle records. Um, our final speaker, speaker today is Marika Olenek. Uh, Marika is an environmental educator and ecologist. She holds a master's degree in natural resources management from the University of Manitoba and has worked as an ecologist in the, in the areas of pollination, av avian and prairie ecology. Marika currently works in, the, in public engagement and education with Parks Canada and is a co-founder of Urban Ecology Winnipeg. Over to you, Marika. Thank you, Stephen. I'm just going to start sharing my screen here. I am fortunate enough that I do get to talk about the green world and the pretty things today, so I've got some nice pictures. So there we go. I think everybody can see that I'm going to be talking today about the bees as well as some other bugs at Fort Ellis. And I just want to acknowledge right up front, I'll be talking about my own research from when I was a master's student a few years back, uh, working with Dr. Nicola Coper and Dr. Richard Westwood. But I'll also touch on some surveys and knowledge that comes from Dr. Westwood, as well as Colin Murray and Dr. Bob Wigley. So just wanted to let you know it's not just me uh, coming at it. The other thing I want to say is happy World Bee Day. Very exciting that that's coincided with this presentation. So I encourage you all to spend some time today, uh, as you are right now, learning a bit more about bees and some of the other critters on the planet. Um, I'm going to be talking about a place called Fort Ellis, which is a property that is conserved by the Nature Conservancy. And I'm just going to, for some reason, my slide won't advance. There we go. Okay. So Fort Ellis is way out in western Manitoba. Uh, you can see my little star there. It's on the Assiniboine River Valley, and it's sort of south of the town of Russell, north of the town of Verdon, and close to the very small town of St. Lazar. And this is a really amazing place. I won't get into all the details, but it is a really diverse uh, set of habitats. Here's a beautiful shot uh, where you can see the mixed grass prairie. You can see that we've got Beaver Creek and associated wetlands. You can see off in the distance, that's the Assiniboine River Valley, and we've got these shaded slopes with a bunch of different types of uh, deciduous forest. So it's really an amazingly diverse place. And uh, full disclosure, I used to work for the Nature Conservancy a few years ago. And at one point, we all agreed that in the case of a zombie apocalypse, Fort Ellis is the place to be. It has everything you might need to survive. And not just for people, but also for other critters like bees, which is what I'm going to talk about next. Um, 
why is it such a great place for bees? Well, here is just a shot. You could look at this yourself. It's from Google Maps. And this is a lot of Western Manitoba. We see cropland squares. Sometimes there's hayland or grasslands. And uh, we see these little patches of uh, occasional natural habitat, like the wetlands, uh, potable wetlands that remain or creeks along here. But this is what we see. We see really human altered habitat. And uh, Candace got into that a little bit about the importance of conserving our grasslands because so much of it has been converted and continues to be converted. Now I want to compare this picture to a beautiful shot of Fort Ellis. And forgive the low resonance of it, but what I really want to highlight is we see much more natural landscape. You can spot it just with the naked eye. We don't see that um, carving up into quarter sections. We see that the land around Fort Ellis has been conserved largely in its natural state. And that's why it's such an important place. Now, in terms of bees, um, we did a limited amount of sampling over a couple of years, but we found some really amazing results. And I'm just going to share you some examples of the bee diversity at Fort Ellis. And before I get too into it, I'm just going to say, what is a bee? Bees are uh, insects, obviously, and they are distinguished from other insects because their larvae, their young, uh, really eat pollen. And therefore, the adults are very keen to collect pollen. Uh, they can also eat it, but they do a lot of carrying it around from plant to plant as they get more of it. And that's why it makes bees so important for pollination. Although other insects will visit flowers, none of them really work that flower over and carry that pollen around to the degree that bees do. And that's what makes them so important, um, not just uh, in and of themselves, but also to making sure that most flowering plants are able to uh, get fertilized and produce seed and keep growing. So we have this really wide diversity of bees, which I just show you just to open up the mind a little bit to how diverse bees can be. We often think of honeybees, but in reality, most bees live a very different life from honeybees. Most of them are solitary. So individual females will lay their own eggs, will take care of their own young. There's no colony. Some bees like uh, bumblebees, which most of us are familiar with, will have a small colony with a queen, but they change every year. Um, and so there'll be new queens starting right now, actually this time of year, um, building their new nests and seasonal, seasonal little nests. Uh, but the majority live by themselves or sometimes in loose groupings. And we also see a really wide variety of sizes and shapes and colors, obviously. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the fact that when you get excited about bees the way I do, you start to learn so many cool things about them. In terms of some of the special bees that we found during our research, one of them was the yellow banded bumblebee, Bombus terracola. This is actually one of the few bee species that is federally listed as a species at risk. It's listed as special concern. And that is largely due to declines um, in Quebec and Ontario over the last several years. And so it's really nice to see that Fort Ellis is able to conserve this species and provide a home for something that is uh, nationally at risk. Another neat bee that you might be familiar with or a, a group of bees are the leafcutter bees. Many people have heard of these. Um, and leafcutter bees, we found about six different species at Fort Ellis. And these bees do just what you think. They cut leaves. And so if you ever see this um, very round circle cut out of a leaf, that is often a leaf cutter bee. And what she's actually doing is taking these leaves and finding a nook or a crevice. This is an example in a piece, uh, an old wood stump, and will create a nest there. And then lay an egg, leave a pollen ball behind for that larvae to eat, and go and cut another circle of leaf and create a whole nest of a little stack of baby bees. So if you're ever wondering what leaf cutter bees are up to, that's why they are cutting those leaves. Another example of something that was fairly unique that we found at Fort Ellis is a bee that's related to leaf cutter bees, uh, a type of resin bee, Dianthidium pudicum. And this uh, specimen and a few others that we found were actually uh, some of the very first records found in Manitoba. This is a Western bee. And so the specimens that we caught at Fort Ellis, along with a few others uh, around the same time that other researchers caught, are some of the very first records in Manitoba and represent basically the north eastern portions of the range known for these resin bees. And their um, nests are actually really cool. Uh, resin bees are called this because they will gather up tiny little pebbles and glue them together with resin and lay the eggs inside. This is not actually the same species, but a very closely related species um, as an example of what those nests look like. So again, really unique diversity in what we found at Fort Ellis. Another really common type of bee are the mining bees. 
And so, so far I've been talking about bees that put their nest above ground, but the majority of bees at Fort Ellis, as well as across Manitoba, tend to nest underground. And so there's a whole group that are called mining bees that tend to do this, as well as a bunch of other ones. But we did find, uh, I think, about a dozen different species of mining bees. And I have a picture just to give you an idea of what I mean by nesting underground. It's hard to see, but it'll look almost like a little anthill. And these mining bees will dig out a little tunnel and down below they'll have chambers where they lay their eggs and bring pollen for the larvae to feed on. So they're actually doing most of what uh, we see out of sight. And it's something you can watch for even in the city or in your back garden, especially this time of year. If you see something that looks like a little bee crawling around on the ground, it may be a mining bee looking for a suitable place to dig out a nest for the season. But look out, we also have uh, either called cuckoo or nomad bees, which um, look quite different. You'll notice this almost looks like a red wasp. And we found several different types of these nomad bees. And these bees actually parasitize the nests of those mining bees. So what she'll do is not bother to collect pollen and feed her own young. Rather, she scopes out and finds where the mining bees are nesting and enters into their nest, laying eggs and leaving them behind in order to eat the hard work and pollen that's been collected by the mining bees. So these are nest parasites or kleptoparasites. And they actually are really interesting too, because they show that we're seeing different levels of uh, diversity amongst the bees in terms of, you can't have a parasite unless it's got something to live off of. So it's a good sign of a healthy uh, functioning ecosystem actually. Finally, I wanna just highlight the sweat bees. The majority of bees that we found at Fort Ellis were different types of sweat bees, often uh, called the Lazioglossum uh, genus. And within that genus, we had Dialectus is a really common subgenus. And these are often really small. A lot of these little dialectid bees are less than a centimeter long. If you looked at them you know, briefly, you might even think they're an ant until you notice their very shiny clear wings. And they tend to be this uh, very bright uh, metallic kind of patterning, sometimes gray or blue or greenish. And they're really diverse. They can nest above ground or below ground. Sometimes they're on their own, sometimes they're in groups. But I just wanted to note them because they're really really common bee, but often very overlooked. And the reason they're called sweat bees is actually because they will visit you and lick your sweat on a hot summer day. They're attracted to that. And so if you ever happen to see one on your arm, you can just gently brush it off and no harm, no foul to anybody. So I just wanted to let you know about those. Overall, we identified 68 different bee species uh, from Fort Ellis. And to put that into context, there's Roughly 220, probably a little bit more now, uh, bee species that have been identified in Manitoba's prairie ecozone, so most of southern Manitoba. And to put that in context, Fort Ellis alone, this beautiful, amazing conservation property, has nearly one third of all the bee species found in southern Manitoba in that prairie ecozone. So it's really important area uh, for protecting those bees. And as my research uh, showed, a big portion of that seems to be because of the amount of natural habitat present. That seems to make a really big difference in the number of bees that are present. And therefore, the protecting these large blocks of area can be really important to maintaining that diversity and abundance of our na native bees. Additionally, I wanted to mention that there's a lot of other things going on in terms of arthropods, arthropods being insects and related things like spiders and arachnids, etc. Currently, there's 365 different species identified at Fort Ellis, but this is from very limited surveys. Most of these are, you know, one or two days, very short term surveys. But even in those short periods of time, 107 different species of beetle have been identified. This includes some very rarely collected um, Sandhill Prairie scarab beetles that are found in the relatively rare Sandhill Prairie areas of Fort Ellis. And you can see a beautiful shiny picture of one of them on the right there. Additionally, we also have identified thus far 83 species of butterflies and moths. But again, I remain really confident that if a little more effort is put into Fort Ellis, those numbers and potentially also uh, identification of rarer and lesser known species are gonna be found at Fort Ellis, just because we could have so much more work to do there. So with that note, I just wanted to show you my beautiful bees one more time. And thank you for spending some time listening to me talk about this. If you did have any questions or wanted to learn anything more about the research that's been done, I know I gave you a very brief overview here. You're welcome to get in touch with me. And I just wanted to thank the Nature Conservancy for the support they gave on my research in the past, as well as for having me here to talk about it today. 
Thanks, Marika, for sharing today. Um, your research really showcases just how much biodiversity can occur in one area. Um, so we have a few questions for the speakers that have been submitted by the audience. Um, as a reminder, if you have a question that you've not yet submitted, please enter it using the chat box feature. Um, let us know who the question is for, and we'll try to get through as many of the questions as time allows. I had one question, I think kind of for Marika, but I think Reed, you could also weigh in on this. Um, in terms of homeowners doing small things to help insects on their properties, what is the current scientific consensus regarding bee houses slash hotels? Um, I could offer a few thoughts and then maybe Reed or someone else may have something else, but um, they can be beneficial, but they do require maintenance. Um, so if you are going to do something like that, you do want to be maintaining it every year. Otherwise, we can get predators or um, diseases building up, which can be detrimental to what we're trying to do, which is create a safer place for bees. So I encourage you to do it could you can definitely find information online, but um, do a little bit of research first so you know how to take care of your bee house if you want to put one in your backyard or on a patio or something. Yeah, I would just add, add like um, don't pluck your dandelions <laughs> um, in your garden because those are important resources for many bees. Great. Um, and then kind of for Candace, but probably also everyone else could weigh in. Um, what are some of the methods used to track individual insects or lizards or very small organis organisms? Um, is it possible? Um, so for lizards especially, we do something called toe clips. So basically um, we assign a number to every single toe of a skink. And then it doesn't, we just cut the tiny tip of the toe off. So basically just the claw of um, and it gives it a unique number based on the combination, combination of toes that are clipped. Um, another way with small snakes is to do something similar that is scale clipping, um, where just the belly scales of the snakes have a bit of like an overhang as they overlap. So if you assign a number to each of the belly scales, you can um, cut them in unique patterns so that when they're captured again, you know what individual you're dealing with. Um. And are there, I guess, uh, ways to track over a distance for such small creatures or? Uh, there are, we didn't employ them, but there are things called, it's radio telemetry. So basically um, they come in a bunch of different sizes, but you can get little trackers that emit a frequency. Um, so you just bring out an antennae and you can follow animals um, and find out where they are based on the beeps. So as you get closer, um, your frequency will be higher of the beeps. Um, Rick or Reed, do you have any insights on how you might do that for insects? Um, I have like, similarly, um, we don't have them in Canada anymore, but uh, like I mentioned, those sylphids, uh, there's a really endangered one called Necrophorus americanus, which is the American burying beetle. Um, they're a really beautiful beetle. Um, they're monitoring wise, um, I know, a lot of researchers will clip a little bit off their elytra to identify whether they've been previously captured or not. So mm -hmm. they do a lot of those like um, catch and release um, to determine population sizes um, and how the population is doing and that kind of thing. And then also I know, well, I'm not sure how common it is, but some, some people use like paint um, put a little dab on an insect or other similar catch, catch and release things. So um, if they show up in another trap, then um, you know if it has paint on it that it's been previously caught and you could tell potentially where it came from, that kind of thing. Cool. Yeah, um, there are, and I haven't done them, so I'm not gonna get into any details, but there are ways of essentially sort of uh, dusting or marking things like bees or other flying insects like mosquitoes um, in order to you know identify which ones are part of a study or something like that and sometimes for bees as well they want to be able to identify how far they're flying and things like that so there are methods to track them but I, I don't want to misrepresent exactly how they're done uh, suffice to say it's possible <laughs> okay thank you everyone. that was interesting um, I had a question uh, for Reed on um, that new species you described, um, or what we think is a new species, um, you said it was 
associated with only three of your sites. At those sites, was it fairly abundant or was it even rare at those locations? It's hard to say. I mean, because it's hard to tell if something's rare based on whether they fell in the pitfall trap or not. Um, mm -hmm. So it's hard to say, but it wasn't like a commonly collected species. Like I only caught 10 specimens in total of okay. the new species. Um, these, they're mostly associated like with wetter areas um, as a group. So they're not really that prone to maybe fall into pitfall traps compared to some of the more fast running um, on dirt predators kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say if um, I'm sure there's um, the 10, the 10 that I caught doesn't necessarily represent the total population size found at those um, sites. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Candice, uh, you, you showed the picture of the prairie skink and the young have that very bright, vibrant blue tail. Is there a adaptation? to that or is there any thoughts on that <laughs> sorry my click is sticky for the mute button um <laughs> yeah so there's a lot of research that's been done um because having a bright blue tail as a lizard is really common it's found in like seven different uh families of lizards um and there's also um in different parts of the world there are some lizards with red tails um some with green and it's commonly thought that it's called the decoy hypothesis um, so research has found that um, oftentimes juveniles will have higher activity rates than the adults. So they're running around more and foraging more, which makes them more at risk to predators because they're more visible. So um, one thought is with the decoy hypothesis um, that it does increase how visible they are to predators, but that ends up being beneficial because it attracts the predators to the tail. So it kind of almost increases predation, but maybe instead of um, risking having it an attack be somewhere lethal where it could kill the animal, it almost always goes to the tail so that the lizard can escape. So kind of like bed hedging a little bit. That's really cool. Um, we also had another question come in uh, for Candice. Um, which boards did you find the most creatures hiding under? Were the ones closer to the forest or those ones more out towards the grassland? So, so far, um, it kind of depends on the species. Almost, I think every single skink that I found was at the forest edge, um, while smooth green snakes kind of tended to be um, a little bit out towards the prairie. And this can all probably, I'll see with my temperature data, but it's likely that they just have differences in um, maybe the temperatures that they prefer to be at. Edges are always, um, and other species as well, are known to be really good spots if you're a reptile because, um, if you need some sunshine, you have space to bask, but there's a lot of shade too, if things get too hot. Cool. Uh, and then I had a question. Um, so flipping the boards over and then having to catch the animal underneath to weigh it, is that difficult to do in the field? Um, it depends kind of on the species and on the day. So. Um, when it's early in the morning or evening, uh, late in the evening, and things are colder, um, reptiles are ectotherms, so they get their, they don't regulate their body temperature like we do. They're the temperature of their environment. So when they're colder, they don't have a lot of energy. So um, yeah, if it's colder, then they kind of don't have the energy to run away. So they just hope I go away and don't bother them. Um, if it's midday, they are very active and warm and they do try to run. So especially with skinks, they are extremely fast. So it's quite difficult. And there's definitely times when they've escaped me before I could grab them. <laughs> Sounds kind of fun. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, Reed, you mentioned for your study, you were looking at uh, different types of land management um, for your traps. Did you see any um, any patterns with like your gray sites versus your burn sites? Yeah, so um, gray sites uh, tended support tended to support a lot greater abundance of beetles, um, but that was mostly driven by um, this one group that I didn't identify the species uh, called the Aliocarine uh, rove beetles. Um, so they're associated with uh, like cow dung and decomposing organic matter. So I 
theorize that um, those grave sites had a lot more accumulated organic matter compared to burn sites. Uh, so that kind of drove the increased abundance on those grave sites. Whereas if you look at a uh, metric like um, uh, Shannon species diversity, burn sites were actually um, more diverse than um, grazed or undisturbed sites. So kind of, and it kind of varied too, like predators especially were more abundant on burn sites, probably because mm -hmm. most of those predators are fast running and there's a lot of thatch and stuff on undisturbed and grazed sites. So those burn sites have more kind of open ground that they can run and uh, catch prey on and fall into pit pitfall traps more preferentially. So that kind of drove that. Cool. Um, Marika, you mentioned catching a whole variety of different types of bees. Um, is that all with like a net or are there different ways there's, of doing it? Yeah, there's a few different ways. The, the way that we chose as uh, sort of easiest and most cost effective are basically uh, using what are called bowl or pan traps, which basically are colored bowls with water um, and you attract the bees because they resemble flowers to their bee brains. And it actually, it kills the bees. So this is not um, live sampling. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't do too much of it. You want to make sure if you're going to be using um, any sort of sampling method that on insects, especially in a conservation area, that you aren't oversampling. So we did a few times each of our sampling periods over a few days. Um, a couple other methods uh, for catching bees are things called blue vein traps, which are a similar approach uh, of trapping. You can also use different types of netting approaches. And in the past, not on my research, but when I was an assistant in the past, we also sometimes did um, basically live ID in the field where you're you know, netting them with a butterfly net, having a good look at what they are. Um, sometimes you can't actually tell the exact species, but you can usually confidently tell the genus or subgenus and then letting them go. So it really depends on the purpose of the research, uh, what you need. Um, and then in terms of how they were sampling some of the other insects, there was a range there for moths. You use traps at night a lot of the time. Um, Bob Wrigley, I know, did what's called sweep netting, which is basically you walk through, say, a grassland and you are sweeping a net through and then you see all the different things that you catch. And that can be a really broad method of sampling, especially in grasslands. So really, there's a lot of variety out there. Um, so it depends on the needs of the research and also how much uh, human resources time you have to be doing identification. Cool, lots of lots of different things. Um, so I think that's about it that we have for questions, unless the last minute one comes in as I'm speaking. <laughs> um, um, but if we didn't, uh, if you have a question after the, um, after the presentation um, or have something else you would like to ask or have any topic request for a future webinar, um, please reach out to us at manitoba at natureconservancy.ca. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today for today's webinar. Candice Reed and Marika, thank you all for sharing your insights and experience, expertise. Um, for updates on future webinars and events in your area, check out our events page at natureconservancy.ca slash events. And then if you'd like to learn a little bit more about NCC's Fort Ells project, a QR code is on the screen. Um, if you use your smartphone's camera, um, you can and you scan, you scan the screen in front of you, um, that will take you to the site, or you can visit fortellis.ca. Stay tuned for the link to today's webinar recording. You'll receive that in our follow-up email within the next several days. And then finally, support for this event has been provided by the Conservation Trust, a Manitoba Climate and Green Plan initiative delivered by the Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation. On behalf of the Nature Conservancy of Canada, thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. And we hope to see you next time.